Does AI replace workers or work? Remember the boy who cried wolf? Everybody panicked, they came over, but there was no wolf. And after a couple of times, he lost all his credibility. Now you're like, what does that have to do with AI? Well, look at this, 1935, uh, Washington Post, thinking machines replace the thinker. 1960, Wall Street Journal. 1980, New York Times. All along, we've been hearing this story over and over again that someone's after our jobs, that machines are going to replace us. Um, this is not nothing new. Even two centuries ago, in, in the during the Industrial Revolution, uh, we had these uh, Luddites uh, who, in Leeds, uh, they they destroyed the textile machines, and there was actually a reward of a thousand pounds, which which comes to about one hundred and thirty thousand Canadian dollars today. So this idea of resistance against technology is nothing new. Uh, you can actually look up the word uh, Luddite in, uh, in the dictionary. It's actually a term for someone who is against progress. Now, the, the cool thing is that always the rhetoric is the same. Always they say this time it's different. But is it? That's where you, you really appreciate what uh, Aesop said, the boy who cried wolf. Now let's look at some data. All of the data I show you in this video are from Canada. So unemployment rate, are we losing jobs really? Well, if you look at this, there isn't any clear trend. Now also you have to watch out. If somebody only shows you aggregate unemployment rates, watch out, you're being hoodwinked. There is not much we can get out of unemployment rate. Like other economic variables, these variables would make sense in relative terms when you break them down by industry or by population groups. So let's look at that. If you look at them by sector in the agricultural and forestry, we have a trend like that in manufacturing, in low skill services, high skill services, and in the public sector. Again, in all of them, when you look at it, uh, there is a lot of variation, but there is no significant trend. By the way, there is less variation if you look at full-time jobs and ages above 25, for obvious reasons. Another meaningful breakdown is looking at the, at the unemployment rate by education. So those with no post-secondary have this trend and those with some post-secondary have this trend. Again, when you look at it, you see that there is no clear um, decrease in uh, or increase in unemployment rate. Uh, technology is never a shock. Technological development is by nature a gradual process. It's a bottom-up change, right? So unemployment rate is simply volatile by nature. It has peaks and troughs due to unpredictable abrupt shocks. And those are different from technology. All this mess is due to some myths and fallacies, including the idea that the labor market is a zero-sum game which is to say that there is a limited amount of output with fixed level of inputs. It's also known as the lump of labor fallacy. What it means is that if the work is done by robots, there must be less work available for humans. And if one side is getting richer, then the other side must be getting poorer. Now this is a fallacy. The fact is that labor and capital are complements, not substitutes. It's very rare that capital replaces labor. They rather work hand in hand. Another one is that employment is inherently desirable in and of itself. The problem is that you have to look at what kind of employment. What if it's like Sisyphus? This also is related to the broken window fallacy. If you don't know what it is, look it up. It's very interesting. It's also the problem with Keynesian economics. So this is a famous quote by John Maynard Keynes in, in his major book. Now, to be, to be fair to him, he said this um, with regards to the uh, gold mining but still was part of his, uh, his agenda that you can actually create jobs by, by simply burying bottles and, and then unburying them. It's possible and desirable to fight technology. So this is another fallacy. What you have to keep in mind is that regulation by the government is gonna increase barriers to entry in the market. So, and then if they transfer income to workers of one industry, it always comes at the expense of all other workers and consumers. There is no free lunch. Regulating businesses through licensure will create barriers to entry, which reduce competition and raise the market power of the very companies which were meant to be kept in check. So licensure is not the solution. 
And both of these policies, regulation and income transfer, both of them have unintended consequences. They will inevitably result in rent seeking by the stakeholders and in favoritism by the policymakers. Right? So those are the two inevitable consequences of these policies. Behind, so this is also a useful tip, behind all government policy is an element of impatience. Impatience in the face of a natural force with its due course will lead to inefficiency. Okay, so instead of the misconception of Keynesian economics, here's another quote which is much more insightful. Now you might be like, so what matters? Well, what really matters is our happiness, is our utility. And in terms of economics, our happiness depends on three main things, the employment, our real wage, and the type of jobs that we have. So we saw that there is no secular decline in, 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 in employment. Let's look at the real wages. The average weekly earnings of, of the workers in the goods sector and services sectors have been increasing over the past two decades. If you look at the salaried and hourly uh, wage earners, that also has been increasing, right? So the real wages haven't been going down either. In fact, this is because of an increase in the demand for labor. So because the labor demand has increasing, the wages have also been increasing. And the most important probably is the type of jobs, and, and that's most evident of all, that, that the type of jobs have been becoming more convenient for the workers. Let's back up a little bit and look at technology in general. When you think of technology, what, what you're talking about is a faster rate. It means a faster rate of production, which means a lower unit cost of production. And AI, including machine learning and deep learning, means the cost of production is going down. And you can think of machine learning receiving the available information and giving unavailable information, right? So that's kind of like the process that's being speeded. And you can think of a lot of examples that have been tried, so these are pretty known. And there have been a lot of improvements in terms of the quality and accuracy of these. So for instance, the Google speech recognition error rate has decreased so much. Uh, I don't have any more recent data, but it's under 5% error rate, which is quite remarkable. Likewise, in image recognition, you can have cupcakes and puppies and like, oh no, what's going on? Well, the accuracy of, of the machines has actually been better than human uh, recognition since 2015. And ImageNet is uh, medical imaging through deep learning. So technology will increase the standard of living of consumers because their living costs will be lower and they get better quality. How about the workers? Well, their marginal product of labor will increase, which is to say each hour of human work will now be more valuable because of the faster rate of production. Okay. This will result in specialization, which means that the human capital is going to increase. People are going to become more skilled. All right. And that would be in areas where humans have comparative advantage. There's going to be a change in task content. So this is going to be important. Make sure you pay attention. The jobs don't vanish. The position isn't eradicated, especially not over, overnight. What happens is that the same position will now include slightly different tasks. It's going to be broadened to include higher skill functions. All right. And that's why the return on skilled labor is going to increase. So those who have more education and who are more skilled are more likely to benefit from this. But either way, the change is gradual. So you have time to adjust. Um, it's creeping, not sweeping. Jobs evolve, they don't dissolve. And the factor augmenting effects dominate the task substituting effects. All right. So here's the thing. You have to put yourself in the shoes of an employer of a business. Remember that development and adoption of new technology is fraught with uncertainty. The businesses are going to be afraid of doing it. Companies will be cautious before replacing a status quo which works. Jobs become more skilled, both for college and non-college graduates, based on these studies. As a form of technology, AI is an input for decision making, which means that it needs complementary assets. The main comparative advantage of AI are tasks which are quantifiable, repeatable, and quick. On the other hand, humans also have a comparative ad advantage. They still have something to offer. The main one is judgment, which is the main complement of AI, and formal education improves our judgment. So that's why higher learning gets a greater, greater return because of technological improvement. So technology is like the accelerator where you also need a driver, and that would be the worker, the human. 
ethical decisions also are things that humans would have to do. Invention and innovation are things that would be the contribution of humans. Areas with little data and the art of context. Overall, algorithm is not context aware. Even though in predictable areas with big data, you can make some improvements. Soft skills is another area, which can be the prerogative of uh, humans. Um, communication skills include both verbal and written. Overall, the shift that's happening is going to lead to more creativity and accountability of the human resources. All right, there's still a paradox to explain, and that is labor productivity growth has slowed down. So over the past four decades, what you see is that the annual growth of productivity has decreased. But again, remember that you have to look at the uh, sectors separately. So if you break this down, you're going to see pretty much the same trend. Uh, one difference is that in the services sector, uh, the, the, the difference in the grades, it's, it's less. Also, just re remember that this doesn't mean that labor productivity is decreasing. It's the growth in labor productivity. So productivity has been increasing, but at, at a slower pace. Now, what's going on? What is the reason for it? The studies suggest that the most plausible explanation is the implementation lags. So which is to say the time that it takes for the diffusion of AI capacities and for the complementary innovations to be developed. This takes time. All right. And especially the more profound the potentials are, the longer it's going to take to impact the economy. So the question to ask is not whether human work is dissolving. That's not the question. The question to ask is in what direction is human work evolving? What happens to the value and convenience of jobs with, with AI and without it? So we have to look at three different stakeholders here, the employers, the employees, and the consumers. And you can look at any example from the history because the trend is always the same. Look at what happens in any form of technological improvement. You're going to see that employers had a lower cost of production, employees had more convenient jobs, and consumers had higher standard of living, especially when you look at uh, long term after the change took, it, took place and was on, under the way. Now, the catch is that there can be short-term transitional unemployment in some sectors. And the important thing is not to focus only in, in some sectors and look at everyone, all of these three different um, players in the market and in all different sectors. So we might have our personal opinion. Some of us might say that, hey, I don't like cars. Maybe carriages would be better. But how about we let people decide with their demand? When people purchase something, they're voting for it. When when people purchase cars instead of carriages, they're saying that they prefer that. It is natural that car producers are going to get to keep their jobs and carriage producers are going to lose their job. But it doesn't mean that overall employment is going to vanish. It's just evolving. The greatest advantage of AI in particular is that it's inherently competitive, which is to say it's going to reduce the market power. It's going to reduce the abuse by big corporations and it's going to increase efficiency because it's effectively open source. It's effectively public domain. To summarize, as capital accumulates, marginal product of labor increases. The shock of AI is due to a lag in developing the complementary innovations. Now, is there a point where the job has evolved so much that it's gone? Well, not abruptly, not overnight. What is replaced are the tasks within the jobs, not the jobs themselves. And because of this improvement in productivity, or the overall level of wealth will increase, and that will increase the demand for new consumer luxury. So this is going to create new jobs, especially wealth work. Uh, these are jobs that didn't exist before, especially in the services sector. So think of Microsoft Word uh, and typing. Uh, we are all experts. We are all doing it very comfortably. But in the 1960s, it was a very rare skill, and workers were scare scared of it. But now it has evolved. The jobs have evolved to include that. To make this more uh, memorable to you, look at this picture. This is a logarithm slide rule. Some of our parents or great or grandparents, uh, they used it because calculators did, weren't available. But now we don't make them anymore and we don't use them any, anymore. We don't know how to use them. So just to make it more memorable, remember, algorithm is very similar to logarithm. That's the fate. That's the evolution that these things have. Thanks for watching and thanks to my friend who helped me along the way.